Hi, this is Bill Bronchik, and this video will discuss the nine mistakes that new investors make and how you can avoid them. Mistake number one, not knowing the market numbers. One of the big things that you need to do as a beginner investor, or even if you have some experience, is to pick particular areas that you work. We call them farm areas. And that's what a lot of businesses do. They don't focus on all customers. They focus on a limited scope or a limited uh, um, uh, cross-section of the population. And in the same way, as a real estate investor, you can pick particular neighborhoods that you choose to invest in. Real estate agents do that as well. They don't usually list houses all over town. They pick three or four neighborhoods and that becomes their farm area, which you want to establish for yourself. And in that farm area, what you want to do is really know what the values are of the houses and what they range so that when a deal comes your way, you don't waste your time running all over town trying to figure out what a house is worth. So, for example, if the low end of the neighborhood is 150 and the high end is 200, you would know that maybe on the smaller end a, a certain type of house, such as a ranch, is worth roughly X and that the two-story house with four bedrooms and two baths is worth roughly Y. And then if you have a baseline, then you can compare and contrast when someone says they have a three-bedroom, two-bath, two-car garage ranch and you know from your research that is worth 165, you have a ballpark and a place to start with so you don't waste your time. Too many people waste time trying to figure out the value of houses. Also within that form area, you want to know what's called the supply curve. And what that is, is a ratio of how many houses have sold compared to how many houses are for sale. And what that will give you is how many months of inventory there is in that neighborhood. So for example, if there are 60 houses that are for sale within a particular defined geography, and 10 have sold within the last month or so, then what you've got is six months of inventory. Six months is what it'll take for everything to liquidate if no more houses went on the market in that neighborhood. And that's really a balanced number, six months. Anything more than that, it's going to be more of a buyer's market. Anything less than that, it's going to be more of a seller's market. You just want to know what that number is and know what kind of market that you're dealing with in within your farm neighborhoods. Number two is mistaken value. Uh, again, if you have a ballpark, you can get an idea of what a house is worth based on your previous research, but you really want to be able to dial that in within 2 to 3% accuracy. Remember, real estate investors only work on a 10% margin at best, maybe a 15 if you're lucky. And if your numbers are off on the value of your house by 5 or 10%, there's your profit out the window, maybe even a loss if you're not careful. So make sure you can dial in values. And websites like Zillow and Trulia and so forth give you estimated automated values. Those are only accurate some of the time. I would rely more on the raw data than on the actual what they call estimates of value. So for example, you can use their raw data to look at what the supply curve is or how many houses are for sale or what houses have sold and then do your own analysis as to the value of the house. But don't go based on the automated numbers that these websites give. They can be inaccurate at times. Number three, us underestimating repairs. If you're doing a fix and flip or a fix and hold, uh, what I recommend you do is round your estimate off to the nearest 5,000 integer. So if you think it's 8,000 in work, just figure 10. If it's 12, figure 15. If it's 18, figure 20. You know, it's, 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 it's just a rule of thumb that if you always round off to the next 5,000, you're never going to have too many surprises. And in rehabs, you always have surprises. So if you already round it off, then you've taken that uh, fudge factor into account there. Number four, a poor choice of contractor. A lot of people who are new investors get burnt, and not just new investors, uh, I've gotten burnt even as an experienced investor with contractors. Make sure you pick someone that's got references, someone that you can put something under contract in writing with, an independent contractor agreement that spells everything out. Don't pay people by the hour, pay them by the job, pay them by performance. So for example, if the job was bid, and it should be bid in detail, not just a new kitchen, but you know what cabinets and what countertops specifically they're putting in, and let's say that the, the whole job is 30000 I might give them um, a third up front for materials, 
another third when the job is substantially complete, which is usually when they say it's all finished. You know, there's usually a lot left there. And then the last third after the punch list, which is the walkthrough and the items that are still have to be done, are done. If you don't hold back enough for that punch list, you end up getting burnt. So don't pay by the hour, don't pay by the date, pay by performance. Uh, number five, a bad contract. Uh, it's amazing to me that people will uh, invest in real estate and deal with $200,000 houses or more and not invest a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars with a good attorney to draft a real estate contract. This is the legal uh, aspects of your purchase and sale and most of the time everything will go fine but it's that one time it goes bad that you can get really burnt and lose tens of thousands of dollars if you have an improperly or poorly drafted contract. So make sure that you are familiar with your local real estate um, uh, realtor forms as well as have a good addendum or separate contract drafted by an attorney. Number six, the wrong legal entity. Many people don't set up an entity at all, which is quite a disaster, a lot of liability issues. Uh, but what they do is they instinctively just set up an LLC single member, which a lot of people do and is often a mistake. Um, there are tax consequences as well as legal consequences to operating a business. And depending on the type of business, whether it's rental income, which is passive, or it's um, wholesale income, which is ordinary, uh, you should be choosing maybe uh, a corporation, S or C Corp, versus an LLC. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying that depending on the type of income that you're earning and the type of business you're doing, you may want to sit down with a tax professional to determine which one is appropriate. Don't automatically assume an LLC is the right way to go just because everybody else does that. Number seven, no marketing plan. What a lot of investors do is they spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to do a deal from A to Z instead of trying to get sellers on the phone, instead of trying to make offers, instead of trying to talk to people to see if they're interested in selling their house. And they waste a lot of time trying to figure out every single detail of the transaction before they even make an offer. Now look, you can hire professionals to help you through the process, but without a seller in front of you, without an offer on the table, it's all academic. So a lot of investors waste a lot of time trying to figure out every detail without drumming up business. Number eight, no script. Uh, so if they do make phone calls, and let's say they talk to sellers on the phone for sale by owners, or they market to get people to call them, they blow it, they blow the money that they've spent generating these leads because they have no telephone script. They have no list of questions. They have no list of uh, information or checklist that they use. And I have an excellent one that I use that just as a reminder, even though I know it pretty well, but just as a reminder to make sure I didn't forget anything to go do through the check checklist and ask the right questions to make sure I get all the appropriate information I need before I go out and look at the property. And number nine, no business plan. A lot of investors consider real estate investing as investing, but it's not investing like the stock market. It's more like a business, and it has to be run like a business, professionally. You should have a plan, and it should be in writing. If your goal, let's say, is to quit your job or retire or um, generate a certain number of income, then you need a written plan for that. When is it going to happen by? What are the intermediate goals? What are the steps you need to take on a monthly, weekly, daily basis in furtherance of each of those goals? And how do you measure if you're on track? You know, if you can't manage what you can't measure. So if you don't have a yardstick to measure your progress, and that would be in your business plan, then you're going to be spinning your wheels and not getting anywhere. These are the nine mistakes, and of course there's many more that beginning investors make, but I hope that you take some of these to heart and that you uh, correct some of these and put your plan into action and have a lot of success. This is Bill Bronchick. Thanks for watching.